Well, first, I want to apologize. There's a bit of a typo here. It's supposed to be part seven, um, but that's because we ran out of time last time. And we were talking about the Millerite movement, which the Millerite movement is really the movement that later on, over time, became these, these two religions here, the Seventh-day Adventist religion and what would later, the Bible students movement, which was from... It was a branch of a branch, really, but um, what would become the Jehovah's Witnesses later on. So we've talked about the origin story of each, and now we are, we're talking about the, we're on the last origin story talking about Seventh-day Adventism, which their origins go, tie back to the Millerite movement, and since the Millerite movement, because we're going to follow, just like we did with Jehovah's Witnesses, they didn't have the name Jehovah's Witness until 1931. So we followed their, their origin story history all the way up until they got that name. Um, because before that, they were part of the Bible students movement, which splintered and fractured. And there's still bi other Bible student movements today that say that they're following Charles Taze Russell. Um, so we're going to follow Seventh-day Adventism all the way up into 1863 when they get their name officially, when they organize. Um, so that's what we're going to be looking at all together, but you can't understand Seventh-day Adventism unless you understand the Millerite movement, and that's why we've been looking at the Millerite movement. So before we begin, let's have a word of prayer as we get started on the second part to the Millerite movement. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this Sabbath and for another opportunity to learn at your feet. We pray, Lord, we pray that you would help us now to understand history, to understand and remember what you've called us to do and what you've called us to be in this world and allow you to change us not us change you or us tell the spirit of prophecy or the Bible what it's saying, but to be transformed by those things into what you would have us to be. That is our prayer this morning. We ask that you'd strengthen us, give us clarity of mind this morning to understand and to see not only the Millerite movement, but the differences between this history and the other origin stories of these other religions that we've been looking at, and to discern which is the truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, this is the section we're on right now, the origins of the religion. And next, we'll look at their authorities and or their authoritative texts, whichever they have, which all of these have a combination of them. Then we're going to look at the big major doctrinal differences. So as you're looking at things like this, you're going to see overlap between the two. But we're going to look at some of their major doctrinal differences and see if they're biblical. Um, and then their la the last thing that we're going to look at is their, their special... Uh, distinct message for the world, because they all have one, and to see which one is uh, the most biblically accurate and um, which one would be considered present truth. So this is where we left off. The start date, because we go into Daniel chapter 8, and if we pick it up, Daniel chapter 8, and this is more of a recap than anything, but Daniel chapter 8, starting in verse 13, it says, I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint, which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And you've got to remember who's receiving this vision. It's Daniel. Right? So in Daniel's mind, in Daniel's mind, 
Daniel is concerned with, because he witnessed the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of what, you know, it's kind of a misnomer, but the destruction of Solomon's temple. It was God's temple, but Solomon built it. He witnessed that. So when he sees this question, how long shall be the vision concerning the, the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? In Daniel's mind, he thinks that they're asking how long until Jerusalem, the physical Jerusalem, is going to be rebuilt. However, that's not necessarily what it's saying. Because if you look at this little horn power here in Daniel chapter 8, in Daniel chapter 8, the little horn power of being spoken of, starting from verse 9 to verse 12, is the Roman Catholic Church system. So the daily being discussed there, or the sanctuary that was cast down, is the understanding of the sanctuary in heaven. Men, the Bible predicted in Daniel's day that there would come a time when men would no longer look to Christ in heaven, but they would begin to look, and the system that he was doing, in the heavenly sanctuary, but they would begin to look on the earth for a system on the earth that would provide them with salvation. So that's what it's talking about. So the answer comes in verse 14. It says, And he said unto me, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So Daniel thinks, 2,300 days, and he understands the day-year principle. Are you saying that Jerusalem is going to lay in ruins for 2,300 years? That's what Daniel thinks. That's why in verse 27, when the, when the interpretation by Gabriel is being given, in verse 27 it says, And I, Daniel, um, sorry, let's start in verse 26. This is Gabriel explaining. He's saying, And the vision of the evening and the mornings, which was told, is true. Wherefore, shut thou up the vision, for it shall be for many days. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick certain days. Afterward, I rose up and did the king's business and was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. So as he's receiving the understanding, the interpretation of what the 2300 days means, because... If you, go, if you go back and look at the original language, when it says 2,300 days, it's two words, evening mornings. So that's what it says. So when he's receiving the interpretation from Gabriel, Gabriel is telling him the vision of the evening and mornings, which was told thee, is true. He's saying, no, no, it is 2,300 days or years. Daniel couldn't handle that because in Daniel's mind, what Gabriel was telling him before he listened to the rest because he fainted, Gabriel was telling him that Jerusalem, his beloved city, was going to sit in ruins for 2,300 years. But that's not what Gabriel was talking about. Gabriel was talking about the work of the Antichrist power on earth, how it would take men and women and take their eyes off of Christ and faith in him and people would no longer look to what he was doing in the sanctuary above to make atonement, but they would look to men on earth for a sacrificial system that would help them achieve atonement, like the sacraments, like confession, like paying uh, you know, tithe and all the different sacraments that they have and you do all of these things, and then you receive salvation. If you do something wrong, you must confess to this priest, and then you will receive atonement after he tells you what to do. You know, usually you've got to pay a certain amount of money, and then you have to do a certain amount of Hail Marys and, and, and do all these things. But instead, of, they would no longer look to what Christ was doing in the heavenly sanctuary anymore, because that would be the truth. 
That's why it says that the sanctuary was cast down, because it would be cast down, it would be taken from heaven and cast down to the earth. And now Daniel, starting in, in chapter 9, Daniel says that he understood the vision. He understood the vision concerning what? Jerusalem. Because he's concerned about Jerusalem. So that's why it says in Daniel chapter 9, verse 2, it says, In the first year of the reign, I, uh, um, the first year of his reign, this is Darius, um, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. See, so now he's understanding, oh, it's 70 years. It's not 2,300 years. And he gets that from Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 10 through 13, and 20, uh, chapter 25, verse 11 in Jeremiah. So now... Daniel is recalibrated, and he gets to the point where Gabriel comes and talks to him. And this is where he picks up. This is where we left off last time. Verse 24 uh, through 27. It says, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon the holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the Most Holy. And therefore, know therefore and understand that the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. So from that time, you will have 69 of the 70-week prophecy would start at the, at the decree of, to restore and build Jerusalem, which we found to be the decree that is in Ezra chapter 7, which happened in 457. Because Ezra starts off in chapter 7, it says in the seventh year of Artaxerxes. Well, if you look in history, recorded history that we have, the seventh year of Artaxerxes, because he began his reign in 463, is 457 B.C. This can be proved by the canon of Ptolemy, which lists the kings in astronomical observations. It can also be uh, proved through the Greek Olympiad dates. Um, it can be proved through the Babylonian, uh, Bab different Babylonian tablets that they have available, and something known in Egypt as the Elephantine Papyri, which contains the identification of the reign of Artaxerxes in 464 BC. So, the seventh year, in the seventh year of Artaxerxes, 457 B.C., this, this prophecy starts. And those 69 years of the, or the, sorry, 69 weeks of the 70 weeks begins in 457 B.C. And the last week, what's the last week? The last week is when Jesus comes onto the scene. It says, after three score and two weeks, shall uh, the Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince uh, that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood. And unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. So listen, verse 27, this is what it talks about. This is the last week. And he shall confirm, this is the work of the Messiah, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, all right, or seven years. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured out upon the desolate. So the Bible's telling us here in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, that Jesus would be there for the last week of the probationary time of the nation of Israel. Jesus would be there, and he would begin his ministry. It's talking about him as a Messiah, so it's not talking about when he's born. It's talking about pretty much from the, the moment of his baptism, when he was anointed with the power of the Holy Spirit. That was the beginning of his ministry. And how long did his ministry last? It says that he was about 30 years old. His ministry lasted how long? Three and a half years. Three and a half years. And then they 
murdered him. He was always meant to be the sacrifice, folks, but they murdered him. As the Passover lamb, they didn't, they didn't look at it that way, the folks doing it, but he was the Passover lamb. And what's amazing about this, it said he was cut off in the midst of the week, right? That's what it said, in the middle. It's amazing to me to think about that the nation of Israel, that their probation time did not close when they killed the Son of God. That's a testimony to the love that God has for his people. There was still three and a half years they had to get their act together to be the chosen nation of God upon this earth. How is it? How is it to me? It's mind-blowing, isn't it? How is it that killing the Son of God is not the line? That it's still further. There's still more grace. There's still more mercy. And when did they seal the deal? They sealed the deal when they martyred Stephen three and a half years later. That's when that door finally closed. But it's a testimony to how much patience and, you know, the, the Bible uses the word long-suffering. Long-suffering. He suffers. It's, it's right there in the pew. It's just kind of tucked in the corner. Long-suffering that God has towards his people. That killing the Son of God was not the final straw? How is that? May we improve our opportunities that he's given us and make our calling an election sure. Paul? You know, the amazing thing is, that's right. Uh, the door was held open until the stoning of Stephen. However, the amazing thing is, what's going on today, they're killing Christ left and right. However, what did Jesus say the unpardonable sin was while he was alive? Pushing the Holy Spirit away. And now, you can kill the Son of God, and you'll get forgiveness. But if you reject or push the Holy Spirit away, there's no hope for you. Think about that. What is going on today? Now, I told you before, and I don't want to take up your time. I know you want to move on. The Moses thing blew my mind. You talk about rejecting the Holy Spirit. You know, I'm not going to go into detail about that. But that... In Adventism today, one, you know, I don't have to, you know very well what one yes. of the major topics is about there is no Holy Spirit. What are you doing? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, let's do a calculation real quick. 457 B.C. plus 2300 years brings us to 1843, right? There's one little problem with this calculation, though. Well, actually, there's two. But one of them you can't really see up here. The one you can't see is that they were using the wrong calendar, so it's going to offset them somewhere in the fall. We'll get to that. The other issue is when you put, type it into your calculator, negative 457, and do plus 2,300, this is the number you will get because your calculator counts zero as a number. But the world doesn't count. We never lived in year zero. Okay, so it was one. It was the first year. And you still think about it. We still, we still have it this uh, in, in our terminology today. The 16th century refers to what time? The 1600s? No. The 1500s. The 20th century referred to when? The 1900s, right? You see how that works? So it's counting zero in your calculator here to get to this number. So you, you drop that, you have to add one more number here. So the real number is 1844. There's a miscalculation there. So picking it back up, William Miller, he was pressured 
by people to give an exact date, something he did not want to do. And that needs to be pointed out for the record. He did not want to do that. But he finally does after being pressured uh, by the Millerites. And remember, the Millerites is a mixed batch of individuals who would eventually form um, a number of groups. One, the, the, most, the most spiritually apostate group that they would eventually uh, become a part of, they didn't form it, was the Shakers, which is really the, one of the precursors to the charismatic movement that we see today. They were called the Shakers because they would shake. They were called the Shakers in their day because they would shake. They would say, this is the moving of the Holy Spirit. And that's something that they would do. So some of them, that's a small number that became part of that group. Most of them became First Day Adventists, First Day Adventists, uh, or the Adventist Christian Church, the ACC. They would go on to set time after time after time and spiritualize a lot of things away. Out of this came the Bible Students Movement, which later became the Jehovah's Witnesses. Okay? So... Another group would go back to their old churches, and some of them lost their faith entirely. Then this, another very small group, the smallest actually, uh, of 50 people became what would later become the Seventh-day Adventist Church. 50 of the 50,000. So there's a big mixed batch here, okay? So you can understand the different pe people and personalities that, uh, that William Miller is dealing with, and they pressure him to give an exact date, and this is what he says. William Miller, this is uh, quoted in James White's book, Sketches of the Christian Life and Public Labors of William Miller, page 182. It says, William Miller says, My principles in brief are that Jesus Christ will come again to this earth, cleanse, purify, and take possession of the same, with all the saints sometime between March 21st, 1843, and March 21st, 1844. So he's giving that whole year, and he's basing that off of, he's basing it off of the Jewish calendar. And that's how he gets those dates. So between this time frame, he says, Christ is supposed to return. So that's what they believed. So there's a lot of anticipation, and they go out, um, and they begin preaching this to everybody. And... It has an effect. People, people respond to the message. This, here's where it is right here. The 2300 days minus the 457. They did it differently, and you get 1843. 1843. Again, that's not accounting for the, for the uh, problematic with uh, the year zero there. So there would have to be an additional uh, year added. So there's a problem with the calculation, and the time frame comes March 21st, 1843 to March 21st, 1844. Guess what happens? Nothing. Christ does not return. So the Millerites, after the time periods between 1843 and 1844, then, April 18th and 19th, 1844, which was set as the next date, was the new moon supposed to be the, the, the new time. It came and went with no return of Jesus Christ. The Millerites were still hopeful and eager for Christ's return. The message of Habakkuk's tarrying time was applied to the Millerites' experience in awaiting the fulfillment of the 2300 days. This is what it says in Habakkuk chapter 2. Verses 2 through 4, it says, And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables, that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him but the just shall live by his faith. So it's kind of interesting, their little message of righteousness by faith there. But they would call this the tarrying time. They believed that they were going through the tarrying time. You see, they had, they had published the vision on tables. That's where, the eight, uh, that's where this uh, 1843 chart comes from, the publishing of the vision. So they, they had already taken that verse and actually applied it 
to what they were doing when they made the chart. They made that connection, which is amazing. And then after the times come and go, they go back to some of these verses and they see that, oh, wait, there's a tarrying time mentioned here. So this is when they are in the tarrying time. They're still expecting Christ any day. It's, it's, that's what the Millerites were going through. Now, something also to point out that's really important, and this is a big difference between uh, William Miller and Charles Taze Russell. Remember when Charles Taze Russell, a few, a few sermons back, you remember when Charles Taze Russell, a uh, vision, not a vision, but uh, his prediction calculation of 1914 came and went? What did he say? Did he admit he was wrong? No, he said, I, I didn't say for a certainty that this would happen. And, 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 and so what? Because we have each other and, and God is good. He said, basic, that's basically what he said in the watchtower. Now think about that for a minute and that garbage political excuse versus William Miller. Again, uh, William Miller quoted in Sylvester Bliss's book, Memoirs of William Miller. This is page 256. William Miller says, I confess my error and acknowledge my disappointment. Yet I still believe that the day of the Lord is near, even at the door. And I exhort you, my brethren, to be watchful and not let that day come upon you unawares. The wicked, the proud, and the bigot will exalt over us. I will try to be patient. God will deliver the godly out of temptation and will reserve the unjust to be punished at Christ's appearing. So, Look at that. I confess my error and acknowledge my disappointment. He was willing to admit he was wrong. Think about that in comparison to someone like, well, in the modern world, someone like uh, David Gates. Right? He had a prediction, didn't he? Do you remember that video that was whipping up people into a frenzy? In Adventism a few years ago in 2019 called Even at the Door. Do you remember that? And do you remember what happened to the people that said that what he was saying was incorrect? Do you remember what they did to those people? They ridiculed them. And what happened? He said, and he said throughout the video, because I had to do, I had to research this and watch, watch his video a number of times to show that he said, David Gates, he said that God had showed him this. Over and over and over again, he said that God had showed him this and that the ceiling would, be, would close or that not that Christ would return, but that the final movements would begin. And he said that it would happen in, in uh, I think it was 2019, he said it would happen. And it didn't happen. Did David Gates apologize? No. He said, he said the same thing Charles Taze Russell said. He said, well, I didn't say for a certainty that this would happen. Folks, that's why it's so important for us not to engage in speculation about times. Because one of the more popular ones that's going around right now is the 6,000-year cycle. That's one of the ones I'm sure you guys have heard, right? The 6,000-year cycle. And the 6,000-year cycle supposedly ends in 2027, I've heard. Well, folks, do you, you know, if you're having a conversation with an Adventist while you guys are eating at lunch, that's one thing. For me to get up here and to present the 6,000-year cycle, by the way, the same 6,000-year cycle that this man used all the time to calculate his false predictions, and to say that, oh, 2027 may or may not happen, even if I said it that way. Would that be good? Would that edify the church? Because if you believe it, if you think, oh my gosh, yes, what he's saying is true. We only have till 2027. I see it. And you begin to galvanize and, to get the, and get the work done. What happens when 2027 comes and goes? What happens to your faith? 
What happens to the faith of every person who got their hopes up in a new date? It weakens. It weakens and erodes. And you begin to forget what you believe. And you begin to blame God in a sense. To say, is, well, if that wasn't true, what else is not true? No, it was false to begin with. That's why speculation has no place in a public forum. Again, it's a big difference between someone having a conversation with another Adventist versus calculating time and showing, and even if you say, well, this may or may not happen. But like with David Gates, he, told, he said, God showed me this over and over and over again. At least five, maybe ten times he said it. God showed. But did God show him that? No. God wasn't showing him that. So where did it come from? That's a scary thought, isn't it? So David Gates doesn't know the difference between the voice of God and the voice of either himself, and there's only one other option, folks, the enemy of souls. He doesn't know the difference between the voice of God and himself and or the devil. What business does he have teaching anything? Especially anything short of a confession of this nature. To say, no, I was in error. I was wrong. And it was much different from William Miller because he was being pressured by the people to do it. He wasn't jumping in front of them and, and telling them this stuff. So what happened to the Adventists after that? Well, in the spring, summertime, one of the uh, Adventist ministers, Samuel S. Snow, comes out with what, what becomes known as the seventh month message or the true midnight cry. Okay, this is what he found. In August of 1844 at a camp meeting in Exeter, New Hampshire, Millerite Samuel S. Snow preached the correct timing of the end of the 2300-day year prophecy. Here's what he, what he saw in the prophecy. The command to restore and build Jerusalem by Artaxerxes occurred in the fifth month, according to Ezra chapter 7, verse 8. So it was in the fifth month. Putting the decree in the fall, not the spring. You see, all their calculations before then had been in March, right? March to March, and then April. So it was always in the springtime. But the actual decree went forth in the fall. Uh, the time for travel from Persia to Jerusalem pushes the date back further before the decree is announced in Israel. The cleansing of the sanctuary happened during the Day of Atonement. You see, now they're getting closer to the true answer. The, the cleansing of the sanctuary, which William Miller and the Millerites believed that the cleansing of the sanctuary meant the destruction of the earth by fire at the coming of Christ. They're starting now to at least get the foundation of an understanding, a new understanding of what that actually means. The cleansing of the sanctuary happened during the Day of Atonement, and this is the actual sanctuary, which was on the 10th day of the seventh month, using the Karyat calendar. They were using the Jewish calendar before, which had its own problems. This would occur on October 22nd, 1844. The message is considered the seventh month message of the true, or the true midnight cry. And the message went like wildfire out to the world. They were now preaching October 22nd, 1844. It all made sense. Daniel chapter 8 refers to the cleansing of the sanctuary. Leviticus chapter 16, talking about the Day of Atonement, refers to the cleansing of the sanctuary. That happened on the 10th day of the seventh month. So using the, obviously they have the Gregorian calendar, finding out what day this, the 10th day of the seventh month was, was October 22nd, 1844. And as far as the calendars are concerned, this is from uh, Froom, 
Prophetic Faith of Our Fathers, Review and Herald, uh, written in, this is volume four, written in 1982, uh, page 796, or at least it's a uh, 18, or 1982 publication. It says, as far back as April, and then in June and December of 1843, and in February of 1844, months before Miller's original date expired for the ending of the Jewish year, 1843, at the time of the vernal equinox in 1844, his associates, who were Silver, Sylvester Bliss, Josiah Litch, Josiah V. Himes, that publishing power we mentioned last time, Nathaniel Southard, Apollos Hale, uh, Nathan Whiting, and others came to a definite conclusion. This was the solution of Daniel's prophecy, is dependent upon the ancient or original Jewish form of the loony solar time, and not upon the altered, modern, rabbinical Jewish calendar. So that was where, the, that was where one of the issues came in, into play, was that William Miller basically just trusted the Jewish calendar, which actually had alterations in it. And that's a long story as to why they have alterations, but I can tell you that the alterations in the rabbinical Jewish calendar have to do with the fact that Jesus Christ fulfills the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9 to a T. So they changed years and removed years from their own calendar so that Jesus would not fit the messianic hope that was there. So they, they went back to the other one. The Karyat calendar was the one that they used. They therefore began to shift from Miller's original date for the ending of the 2300 years at the equinox in March over to the new moon of April 1844. And then, of course, later on, Samuel Snow has that seventh month message. So they corrected the calendar. That's how they get to April. And then Samuel Snow notices that the decree happens in the fall, not the spring. So it gets pushed to the fall. And then he also notices that the cleansing of the sanctuary happened on the Day of Atonement and that the Day of Atonement would be October 22nd, 1844. So that's the message that goes out. So they get back to work. Nathaniel Southard in uh, the Midnight Cry publication from October 31st, 1844. This is after the fact, but he talks about it. It swept over the land with the velocity of a tornado, and it reached hearts in different and distant places almost simultaneously. So they got back to work, and they started getting this message out. And then 1844 comes, uh, October 22nd, and they experience what we remember as the Great Disappointment. The Great Controversy, page 405. Just listen, just listen to this, because uh, remember, I'm quoting Mrs. White here, not as an authoritative sense that I would quote, because I'm, I'm trying to compare all these religions. So I'm quoting her right now as a, a person who saw this, a witness. But listen to what she says. Had the disciples realized that Christ was going to judgment and to death, they could not have fulfilled this prophecy. In like manner, Miller and his associates fulfilled prophecy and gave a message which inspiration had foretold should be given to the world, but which they could not have given had they fully understood the prophecies pointing out their disappointment and presenting another message to be preached to all nations before the Lord should come. The first and second angels' messages were given at the right time and accomplished the work which God designed them to accomplish by them, or which God designed to accomplish by them. The world had been looking on, expecting that if the time passed, Christ did not appear, and the whole system of Adventism would be given up. But while many under strong temptation yielded their faith, there were some who stood firm. The fruits of the Advent movement, the spirit of humility and heart searching of renouncing the world and reformation of life, which had attended the work, testified that it was of God. They dared not deny the power of the Holy Spirit, which had witnessed to the preaching of the second advent, and they could detect no error in their reckoning of the prophetic periods. So the problem really comes into play, not in the calculation of the time, but in the event that was to take place. 
You see, they assumed because it was a, it was a, it was a, this is why we shouldn't let modern beliefs influence what we are studying in the Bible. Because they believed, just because it was common in the day to believe, that the cleansing of the sanctuary, spoken of in Daniel chapter 8, verse 14, that that was talking about the cleansing of the earth by fire. But it wasn't. It was talking about the cleansing of the sanctuary. The sanctuary here on earth, in the Day of Atonement, or as Paul brings out in Hebrews, that there was also another sanctuary. In chapter 9 of, of Hebrews, it says, Then verily the first covenant also had ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary, for there was the tabernacle made, uh, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary, and the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer, and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, Aaron's rod that had budded, and the tables of the covenant, or the law of God. That's what was, was within the ark of the covenant. And over it, the cherubims of glory shadowing down the mercy seat, which, of which we can now, uh, cannot now speak particularly. And if you go back to Hebrews chapter 8, starting in verse 1, it says, Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, not in earth, in heavens, a minister of the sanctuary, where? In heaven, not on earth. And of the true tabernacle, where? In heaven, not on earth, which the Lord pitched and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, whereof it is of necessity that this man have somewhat to offer. For if he were here on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests according, um, that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of, of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, saith he, that thou make things, all things according to the pattern shown thee on the mount. So the sanctuary wasn't, the cleansing of the sanctuary was the one that was happening in heaven. So this is not a spiritualizing away like Charles Chase Russell did, where he said, well, Christ came back invisibly just because. He didn't come back in the way that he, he said he would. No. This was a misunderstanding of what the passage in Daniel chapter 8 actually said. And in such, Mrs. White points out very clearly here that it's, isn't it ironic that their misunderstanding of the passage made it possible for them to fulfill that prophecy? just like the disciples. If the disciples believed, see, the disciples had a belief, and it was a very common belief in the day, that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, was going to set up his kingdom in Jerusalem. He was going to put Rome under their feet and that they were going to take over the whole world. That's what their belief was. That's who they thought Jesus was. That's why Judas betrayed him. Judas betrayed him because he was trying to force Jesus to take power. But that's not what his mission was. And how many, and it's, it's, it's their own fault that they, don't, that they didn't know. It's not like God was trying to hide it from them. It's not like Jesus was trying to hide it from them. If you read in the Gospels, how many times did Jesus point blank tell his disciples, I am going to Jerusalem to be tried and, and killed by the Pharisees and I will die. And at one of, those, one, one of those times, Peter said, don't say stuff like that. And what did, he, what did Jesus say to him? Get thee behind me, Satan. He knew that it was Satan speaking through him when he said that. So if we are going to fault the Adventists, think about this. If we're going to fault the Adventists with, a, with, with the charge of of following a false prophecy, 
right? A failed prophecy. If we're going to charge the Adventists with that, then the disciples get the same charge. Because Peter believed, even though he was told point blank by Jesus, that Jesus was going to set up his kingdom there on earth. That's why the disciples were arguing over who's going to have the first place. That's why the mother of James and John went to Jesus and asked that he would, be, he would drink of the same cup and be baptized with the same baptism as Jesus because she was trying to ensure position for her children. And Jesus said, you don't know what you're asking because he came here to die. That's what his mission was. He came here to be the fulfillment, the ransom for sin, the payment. And that's exactly what he did. And it's, it's ironic that the disciples who believed that Jesus was going to be this conquering king were able, because of that, they were able to declare him with such power during the triumphal entry. Now, if they believed that Jesus was coming to die, even though he did tell them that, they wouldn't have been able to declare Jesus as they did, not only at the triumphal entry, but throughout their ministry. Isn't that amazing? The disciples went through their own great disappointment, didn't they? When Christ died and they thought, wait a second, uh, how, do, how, is, how is Rome going to be taken over? How is everything going to be made right in Jerusalem? The Messiah died. Was he not really the Messiah? No. They misunderstood the event, not the time. They misunderstood what was supposed to take place. And so did the Millerites. They misunderstood what was supposed to take place. The error was on them alone. The Bible was very clear. Daniel chapter 8 makes no bones about it. It's the cleansing of the sanctuary, not the destruction of the earth by fire at the second coming of Christ. This disappointment cut real deep. Hiram Edson, from an undated manuscript of his life and experience, which was quoted in uh, George R. Knight's book, William Miller and the Rise of Adventism, uh, written in 2010. This is page 184. This is, this is Hiram Edson, one of the Millerites, this was his experience. Our fondest hopes and expectations were blasted, and such a spirit of weeping came over us as I never experienced before. It seemed that the loss of all earthly friends could, not, could have been no comparison. We wept and wept till the day dawn. I mused in my own heart, saying, my Advent experience had been the richest and brightest of all my Christian experience. If this had proven to failure, what was the rest of my Christian experience worth? Has the Bible proved a failure? Is there no God, no heaven, no golden home city, no paradise? Is all this but a cunningly devised fable? Is there no reality to our fondest hopes and expectation of these things? And thus, we had something to grieve and weep over. If all our fondest hopes were lost, and as I said, we wept till the day dawn. Could you imagine the pain they must have felt to cry? And when he says they're not crying, they're weeping until the day dawned. Well, October 23rd, the next day, 1844, Hiram Edson, I don't know if I'd call it a vision as a a, an opening up of an understanding that he had as he was walking through the cornfields that day. This is, this is quoted from lineagejourney.com uh, on Hiram Edson. Their article is called Hiram Edson, uh, the Farmer in the Cornfield. This is what it says. When October 23, 1844 dawned and the little group of Millerites huddled in Edson's farm uh, had managed to check the first outpouring of grief, Edson led the way to his barn. Here they gathered and spent the morning in prayer. After this season of prayer, Edson, accompanied by his uh, friend Owen Crozier, that's uh, O-R-L Crozier, for those of you who, who recognize that name, 
decided to make a trip across his cornfield. They wanted to visit some of their Millerite neighbors and encourage them. And as they were making their way across the field, Edson stopped short and seemed to stare straight ahead. Puzzled, Crozier pulled to an abrupt stop behind him, calling out, Brother Edson, what are you stopping for? To which Edson replied, God is answering our morning prayer, giving light regarding our disappointment. Edson later explained that as he was walking, he felt as if a hand was laid on his shoulder, and he seemed to have a vision of the heavenly sanctuary where he saw that Jesus had that very day entered into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary to begin the work of judgment. Crozier and Edson, along with their friend and neighbor, Franklin B. Hahn, spent the next several weeks and months poring over their Bibles, studying the themes of the sanctuary and judgment. In March of 1845, they published their findings in a small paper called The Day Dawn. Crozier began uh, being a school teacher, wrote the article while Edson and his wife sold their best silverware to raise money to fund the publication and Han had the material published. So he published this at expense to himself. And what was the key that unlocked it all? the true understanding of the sanctuary, the proper place of the sanctuary and the tabernacle that was in heaven was what unlocked all of this and helped them to understand that they didn't miscalculate the time, but they misunderstood the event. And it wasn't the first time that people had misunderstood the event. So after the great disappointment, you have, a, you have the splits, of these different groups, a big schism, if you will. Some said that there was no second advent. Some spiritualized it away. These are the major groups that came out of it. The majority of left, Christian, uh, left Christianity, and some of them went back to their churches. That was the biggest group. The next biggest group was called the Adventist Christian Church, or also known as uh, the First Day Adventists. This is where time setting and time setting and setting of new times would happen over and over and over again. And the Bible students movement would come out of that, which would later become the Jehovah's Witnesses. The next smallest group, or the first smallest group here, was those who spiritualized it away. They started the Holy Flesh Movement, which is it's basically the charismatic movement in their day, okay? And they ended up joining the Shakers. Out of the 50,000 in New England at that time who were waiting for the Lord's return and experienced the great disappointment, 50, a remnant of a remnant, became this group. The date is not about the Second Advent is the conclusion they came to. The time is right. The event was wrong. They became the Seventh-day Adventist group. Mrs. White says this in page 411. With earnest prayer, they reviewed their position and studied the scriptures to discover their mistake. As they could see no error in their reckoning of the prophetic periods, they were led to examine more closely the subject of the sanctuary. In their investigation, they learned that there is no scripture evidence sustaining the popular view that the earth is the sanctuary. But they found in the Bible a full explanation of the subject of the sanctuary, its nature, location, and services. The testimony of the sacred writers being so clear and ample as to place the matter beyond all question. The Apostle Paul in the Epistle to the Hebrews says, For verily, the first covenant also had ordinance of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first, wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant over, overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant, or the law of God. 
and over it the cherubims of glory showing the mercy seat. That's Hebrews chapter 9, verses 1 through 5. And again, that's Great Controversy, page 411. We read this earlier. So the sanctuary on earth is a replica. They serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. The tabernacle that was here on earth, Solomon's temple, Zerubbabel's temple, and what you know later on would become Herod's temple, that was all a replica pointing to the true, which was in heaven. It was an object lesson, in other words, folks. The sanctuary and its services, there was never any power at all in any of those things here on earth. They were merely an object lesson for us to be able to understand what God was going to do and what God was doing in the sanctuary above. That's what it always meant. And the Antichrist power took our eyes off of that and put it here on the earth. Hiram Edson is the moment when Christians start to get that understanding back. Oh, and that's it. Next time, we will look at the history of the Seventh-day Adventist Church going all the way up to 1863 when they finally became Seventh-day Adventists. And we'll see how they learned about the sanctuary and how it brought them to the law of God. We'll talk about Rachel Oaks and Joseph Bates and, yes, Mrs. White as well. So... Let's close and have prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the clarity and simplicity of your word. We thank you for the spirit of prophecy. We ask that you would help us, Lord, as we continue this study to understand, to understand what what messages you were trying to teach your people in the Millerite movement and then later on through the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Help us to follow you, Lord, with our whole hearts. Help us to lay everything on the altar and be like those people like Hiram Edson who are willing to suffer loss to get this message out. In Jesus' name, amen.